Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Um, as you previously know, the last video was about uh, an old told history, untold history, um, Mary Ellen Pleasant. This video is another untold history video. Um, as you may notice, I did wear the same shirt because like I said, I'm recording these back to back. This untold history will be about the real people behind Netflix's The Harder They Fall. So if you don't know uh, the movie The Harder They Fall that was on Netflix, um, it came out this past fall in 2021, like October, November-ish. Um, and it was a Western um, using real names of, you know, cowboys and outlaws. Um, but it was like a fake scenario. So I'm going to be talking about the real people behind uh, this movie. So first things first, if you did not know, my name is Kiana. I have a segment on my channel called Untold History, um, where we talk about, you know, untold history, forgotten stories, um, you know, forgotten people. And we like to use different types of, I don't know, mediums to tell the story. Like last video, we used a whiteboard because the story was all over the place. Today, we're going back to our roots, okay? And we're going to do our makeup while telling these stories. Um, I believe that is all I need to say for introduction because this is going to be a long one. So let's go ahead and get started. So... Uh, the real people behind the harder they fall. First be person being Nat Love. Oh, disclaimer. Actually, none of these people really knew each other. Just putting that out there. If you did not know, now you know. None of these people actually knew each other. Okay. So, first things first. First person we're talking about is Nat Love. Nat Love was born into slavery on June in June 1854 in Davidson County, Tennessee. His father is Samson Love. His mother's name is unknown. I just got, all right. His father's name is Samson Love. His mother's name is unknown. As a young boy, um, Nat, he learned skills of roping, herding, branding cattle and horses. Okay, after the Civil War, his family was set free. Um, his parents remained on the plantation as sharecroppers. And at the age of 15, after winning a horse in a raffle, um, he gave, you know, half of the earnings of that to his mother after selling the horse. And he moved and he took the rest of the half and moved to Dodge City, Kansas. Okay, he got a job as a cowboy driving cattle on the trails and first on the Dual Ranch in Texas Panhandle, then on Gallagher Ranch in Southern Arizona. Okay, in 1889, he married his wife, Alice, and they had one child together. Okay, he earned the nickname Deadwood Dick. Please do not try to censor me for that uh, that was the nickname okay um he he will earn the nickname deadwood dick um after winning a shooting contest in deadwood city so that's typically what happened with a lot of nicknames people got during the turn of the time they'll like win a contest or something and they will get the nickname basically the nickname will somehow feature uh, whatever town they won the contest in. So you'll see that a lot um, around this time. So there are legends that a group of Native Americans ambushed him and that Nat Love, he fought back, you know, vigorously and, and he like impressed the Native Americans so much that, you know, they let him live among their tribe. 
It's also said that the chief, you know, offered him a hundred ponies because he was so strong and so brave. He offered him a hundred ponies to stay in. I love he, you know, he uh, declined the offer and then stole the best pony. Stole the best pony and rode away into the sunset, <laughs> essentially. So, you know, after working the trails, he got a job as a Pullman on um, um got a job as a Pullman porter on the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad and in 1907 he pub he published a memoir telling his life as a cowboy it is believed that he died at the age of 71 in 1920 uh, in 1921 so let's let's just say but if you do the math, he'll be more like around 67 to 71. So, you know, I don't know. Some, some of these historians, they don't know math. I, for one, do not know math. But if he was born in 1854 and he died in 1921, he'd be more like 67 though. So we're going to say he was like 67 when he died. Then the official count that he was 71. Unless they got the year wrong. Okay. Uh, so, there is so little known about black cowboys during this time. Um, so, like, a lot of people, when you think about cowboys, you think about Clint Eastwood, right? You think about a white man, straw hats, uh, grass <laughs> in their mouth, two picks. And they're riding on the horses, you know the you know the westerns that your grandpa and your uncles and things like that was falling asleep on the couch too. Typically, the the westerns they were not actually like that. So yeah, there were some white people there, but in the west it was mainly Mexicans and black people and Native Americans that were there in the west. The narrative that white people were there mainly as cowboys. You know, you know, got whitewashed because let's be real, they weren't really there that often. They weren't, they weren't, they weren't okay. After they then made their goal, they went back, they went back east, and uh, guess who remained exactly? So that's so just so you know your history we was we was in the west we was cowboys we were cowboys okay uh next on our list is talking about the rufus buck gang all right so rufus buck gang was an outlaw gang Ooh, that was loud wasn't it and i lost it i don't lost my concealer here it is all right, back to what I was saying. The Rufus Buck game was an outlaw game that consisted of Rufus Buck, Lewis Davis, Sam Sampson, Moloma July, and Lucky Davis. So it was mostly a group of Black and Native American groups, people, that was in this game. Okay. Um, they went on a brief but horrific crime spree in Indian in Indian Territory or modern-day Oklahoma between July 30th and August 4th, 1895. Okay? Their crime spree began when they ran when they um their crime spree began when they robbed a grocery store. Um US Deputy John Garrett, one of the few black uh marshals in the area, responded to the call and was murdered by the gang. Okay, and that was July 30th. The next day, they robbed a man and his daughter. Okay, they held him at gunpoint, uh, kidnapped and raped the daughter, who later died of her injuries. In the next two weeks after that, the group committed other robberies. Uh, the gang robbed an elderly man named Bill Ben. Bill Ben. His name is Ben. Ben and Callahan and gave him a chance to escape. 
And so if he could outrun them, okay, um, give him a chance to, can't, to escape. And if he could outrun them, they weren't going to kill him. And so when he did that, they killed his assistant out of frustration. So it was a lose-lose situation. It's like, honestly, they just wanted to kill somebody at that point. Like, honestly, like you can't, you only give him a chance to escape. And once he does escape, y'all like, well, fuck. You can't heal him. We're going we gonna to kill his little assistant here. Uh, they robbed the stockman, taking his clothes and boots and firing at him while he fled. So, that was wild. Um, two days later, they gang-raped uh, Rosetta Hansen while they held her husband at gunpoint. Uh, Hansen, she also died of her injuries. They also killed uh, Gus Chambers when he resisted their theft of his horses. So... Yeah, they went up. <laughs> I'm telling you, Rupert's Bug Gang, they were wild. They was they was wild. They was a wild group. They was out here just killing and robbing and murdering just about anybody they could. Anybody that got in their way, they was like, move, bitch, get out the way, or you gonna die, basically. Basically. Um, on August 10th, 19... <sighs> August 10th, 1895. I'm sorry, y'all. I cannot, I cannot talk. That's my problem. That's my problem. I cannot speak. Okay. On August 10th, 1895, the gang was finally called by U.S. Marshals and the Creek Light Horse Police. Uh, a gunfight happened that lasted for a day until the gang surrendered. Um... After they surrendered, the game was almost lynched. Um, the Creek, that tribe, they wanted, the Creek Nation, they wanted them to hold them for trial. But they were taken to Fort Smith, Arkansas and to face U.S. District Court Justice Isaac Parker. You're going to hear his name come up a lot because uh, a lot of this does take around, around the same time. But a lot of these people do not know each other. Okay. Usually it takes around the same time, but they do not know each other. And so Fort just explained a lot of the trials that took place in the West uh, for these crimes, for the actual outlaws, took place in Fort Smith, Arkansas. And the judge was usually Judge Isaac Parker. All right. Uh, they were tried and convicted of rape, murder, and sentenced to death. Okay, this verdict was appeal, which delayed their execution. The appeal, of course, was denied because they were later executed on July 1st, 1996. All five members of the Rufus Buck gang were executed. And Rufus Buck himself was only 21. He was only 21. So he decided, you know, at 20, to start a life of crime. For what I don't know, bored. I can only I can only say it, it had to be boredom, because at twenty you got your whole life ahead of you. I don't know how much life it had you is uh, in the late eighteen hundreds, but twenty you expect to like start a family then. So it's like you decided fuck that. Let me go rob people. I guess. I guess if you're not ready. But it's like you could have just not done it. I don't know. Our life is some little shit. You know? You know? You don't have to turn to crime. But that's just me. I don't know about y'all. But that's just me. Anyway. So the next person we are talking about is none other than Miss Stagecoach Mary Fields. Okay. So 
Miss Mary Fields was born into slavery in either 1832 or 1833. Much of her early life is unknown. Okay, just putting that out there. It, so I can't really tell you, you know, you know, what, you know, what plantation she grew up on or, you know, how she was treated or, you know, if she was like transported between, you know, families or anything like that. I can't, like much of her, her life was unknown. And we're most likely it was because, you know, slavery, not keeping records. I look ghostly in this light, don't I? Shit. We're gonna fix this. Shit. Anyway. What is known, though, is that she worked for the Warner Family Plantation in West Virginia until the Civil War. Okay. She was set free in 1863 and she moved from West Virginia up the Mississippi River where she worked on steamboats. She then settled in Toledo, Ohio, where she worked at a convent, okay? Um, during her time there, she did laundry, bought supplies, uh, managed the kitchen, maintained the gardens and the grounds. Uh, it's known that she would yell at anyone <laughs> that stepped on the grass after she cut it. And I would honestly feel a little sane. I feel around that. It's like, I just cut the skirt. It's like someone messing up your floors and you just mopped. It's like, like you saw me doing all this hard work and you just gonna come in and mess that up. How dare you? So I feel around that. It's like, you, I just cleaned up. I just cleaned up and you just going to come in and mess up my hard work. You can wait like a day. No, you just had to come in right then, right there. So, um, it's not clear at, um, why she ended up leaving Toledo, but it's rumored that she left to take care of a friend who was sick. Um, once she moved west, she didn't move west, uh, she got another job working at a mission doing the same duties that she was doing at the convent. Um, she was dismissed from that mission, uh, due to her behavior and temper, um, and for drinking and smoking in saloons with, uh, men. Um, then she moved to Cascade, Montana where she tries to open a few eateries, but um, they fell due, uh, due to her allowing people to eat for free. Um, she also had a laundromat that she did, and then she did other, you know, little odd jobs here and there for money. Uh, by this time, Mary's drinking, gun-toting, and smoking were well known throughout the town. So she, she was well known throughout the town that she always gonna have a gun on her that she's going to have herself something to drink and she'll have her some something to smoke. All right. Um, but in 1895, okay, uh, she, while she was in her early 60s, she was contacted by the U.S. Post Office to be a star route carrier. Okay. Um... She was the first black and the second woman to receive a star route contract, okay? If you did not know, a star route carrier was an independent contractor who, you, who used a stagecoach. That's how she got the nickname. Who used a stagecoach to deliver mail um, in harsh weather in Northern Montana. So wherever the post office couldn't get to on their own, they contracted somebody else to go out and do that, which is basically still happening today, kind of. Anyway, so, um, she, Miss Mary, she built a reputation while working as a mail carrier. Of course, that's how she got the nickname, Stagecoach Mary. And her 
job was not only to deliver the mail but to protect it from bandits thieves wolves and weather okay uh she was also known uh for the guns that she carried which was mainly a rifle and a revolver she was a state she was a star root carrier for eight years she retired in the early 20th century specifically 1903 okay she became a beloved member of the cascade community um when women were outlawed from bars um uh, the mayor made an exception for mary and only mary likewise her house was burned down in 1912 the town paid to rebuild it because she was such a respected figure in cascade um and on her birthday you know the schools will close to celebrate it that's how popular miss mary was to these people that's how beloved she was to these people <laughs> um once she retired she opened up another uh, laundry business and an eatery uh and, ba and she babysat the local children uh she became, remained famous she remained famous and even became the town's mascot for the baseball team. Uh, Stagecoach Mary Fields died December 5th, 1914. Uh, her funeral was said to be the largest one in town. Like the entire town came out and was like, oh, Miss Mary, she gone, but she not forgotten. And so they all came out. I mean, how could they not? They closed down the schools when it was her birthday. So I can only imagine how how they did when she actually died. Okay. Uh, next person on our list is Bass Reeves. Bass Reeves, he had a lot of details about him. So this one's going to be a long one. Okay. Bass Reeves was born into slavery in 1838 in Crawford County, Arkansas. Okay. Bass Reeves will be known as the first black U.S. Deputy Marshal west of the Mississippi River. Okay. Owned by a man named William Reeves, and like his parents, took the surname, okay? Reeves started as a water boy before becoming a field hand. In, 19, in 18, I keep trying to say 19, I'm sorry, y'all. In 1846, William Reeves moved his plantation to Grayson County, Texas, when Texas conceded, Bass was taken into battle with William Reeves' son, George. Okay. Uh, side note, George died in 1882 of rabies, which he gets. That's what he gets for taking his slave into, into battle, into war with him. And for into a war where, where he's fighting to keep him as a slave. That's what he fucking gets. That's what he gets. Oh, that's what he gets. That's anyway. During these years that um, Bass Reeves was um, with George in the war, um, it said that you know. As he he left some say it was during a fight during a card game um others say he ran away personally i believe that he ran away uh, it just seemed more plausible uh, that a fight that a slave fighting for the confederacy during the civil war would free would flee slavery so um but 
it was like not official but you, i can only just imagine him fighting for the confederacy and then somehow gaining knowledge of what the confederacy was actually fighting for and he was like fuck that i'm gonna leave so anyway uh, no matter the reason he found himself in oklahoma and took refuge with the Seminole, Cherokee, and Creek tribes. Uh, he learned their culture, customs, and also perfected his firearm skills. Okay. After the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, Reeves left Oklahoma and bought land near Van Buren, Arkansas, and became a successful farmer and rancher. Okay, what is next here for me? Gotta add a little color to this face, don't I? That's what I gotta do. Okay. Uh, where was I? In 1864, he married his wife, Nellie Jenny, and they had 10 children together. It is said that Reeves sometimes served as a scout and guide for deputy marshals going into Oklahoma. Um, Reeves' life as a farmer would change after the uh, Federal Western District Court acts uh, was to appoint official district district court. I sorry, cut that whole last minute. All right. Reeves' life as a as a farmer would change after the Federal Western District Court was moved to Fort Smith. Okay, Oklahoma had become lawless. Okay, one of Isaac Parker's um, first official acts as was to appoint James F. Fagan as the head of 200 deputies in Oklahoma and since Bass Reeves was knowledgeable of the land in several different tribal languages he was soon recruited to be one of these deputies okay uh, while working among other lawmen Reeves rode through Oklahoma in search of outlaws always seen riding on a white stallion um, he had a reputation of being well-dressed, polite, and courteous. Um, but in 18, but in 1887, though, he, um, Reese was charged with murder of a posse cook. Okay, that, that is wrong. There you go. Okay, he was charged with murder of a posse cook. Um, he was tried before Judge Parker and was acquitted. Mm. Don't that sound a little familiar? Just a tad bit familiar. All right. We don't know if he actually did kill this posse cook, but this just sounds a little too familiar. All right. He was acquitted of the murder. Um, in 1889, when Reeves was assigned to Paris, Texas, he went after the Tom Story gang. In 1890, he arrested a Seminole outlaw named Greenleaf who murdered seven people and was on the run for 18 years. Girl, how you on the run for 18 years and out of the, out the blue you get? Oh my God. This smells so, this smells so good. What is this? 
the Essence Sun Club Luminous Browsing. I cannot read. That says bronzing, and I said browsing. Luminous Browsing Powder. That smells good. Smells like vanilla. Yeah. Girl, that smells good. Anyway, where was I? Yeah. In 1890, he was arrested. He arrested a Seminole um, outlaw named Greenleaf who murdered seven people and was on the run for 18 years. In 1896, his wife died. And four years later, he remarried a woman named Winnie Sumter. In 1902, uh, Bass Reeves, he faced his um, most toughest manhunt because um, he had to track down his son, Benny. Benny Reeves was wanted for murder of his wife in a jealous rage. So he murdered his wife in a jealous rage and he was a wanted man. And guess who had to hunt down this wanted man? His daddy. His daddy had to hunt down this wanted man. So, uh, two weeks later, Reeves caught his son and turned him in. In 1907, his duties as a deputy marshal came to an end. Um, he then became a patrolman with the Muscogee, Oklahoma Police Department. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Muscogee, Oklahoma Police Department, and two years later, he was diagnosed with Bright's disease. Bass Reeves died in died on January 12, 1910. Okay. Um, he made more than 3,000 arrests during his time on the job and only shot and killed 14 of them in self defense which honestly that's kind of impressive uh more modern day cops should definitely take note to that but at the same time it's like did you kill that man bass reeves and get away with it did you or did you not that's that's my question did you or did you not were you acquitted because you were a deputy marshal or did you actually not kill that man? I would like to say he actually did not kill that man, but you never know. You never know. Okay. Now, we're about to get into our most lawless person that I've probably researched ever uh, besides... King Leopold and we will talk about King Leopold and his crimes against literally all people of the Congo we will talk about that we will get into that anyway next person we are talking about is called Cherokee Bill now, Cherokee Bill was born Crawford Goldsby in Fort Concho, Texas on February 8th, 1876. Let's pause for a reach. There we go. He was an outlaw who was mainly in Oklahoma, leading a gang of thieves and murderers in the late 1800s. His parents were named St. George and Ellen Bet Goldsby. Yeah. St. George and Ellen Bet Goldsby. His father was a mulatto man from Alabama who was a sergeant in the 10th United States Cavalry and a Buffalo soldier. His mother was a Cherokee Freeman who was mixed with African, Native American, and white. So if you did not come to the conclusion that he was light, he was white. All right. Um, when his parents, when he was seven, his parents separated and he and his mother moved to Fort Gibson in Indian Territory. 
he was sent to an Indian school in Art in not in Arkansas in Kansas. He was sent to an Indian school in Kansas uh, for three years. After he was sent to an industrial school for Indians in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, for two years. Despite trying to provide a good education, we're going to go back and forth between his uh, outlaw name and his real name. Um, but was, right now, we're going to call him his real name. His mama named him Crawford, so I'm going to call him Crawford. Okay? Despite trying to give provide a good education, Crawford could barely read and write. Okay? He left school at the age of 12 and moved back to Fort Gibson. Um, it was said that he killed his first man at the age of 12. Okay. He shot and killed his brother-in-law, but was not persecuted because of his age. At age 18, he began his life uh, as an outlaw. Y'all thought Rufus Buck was wild, you know, deciding to start his life of crime at 20. Crawford over here, he was like, fuck all that. Forget all of that. We out the gate starting with crime. 18 years old, he said, bitch, I'm a criminal. Okay. And then because, so at age 18, he began his life as an outlaw, becoming one of the most dangerous and feared men in Oklahoma. In the spring of 1894, um, his crime spree, crime spree began um, when he shot a man named Jake Lewis for beating up his younger brother. Uh, now going by Cherokee Bill, uh, he fled to the Creek and Seminole Nations where he joined forces with Jim and Bill Cook. Um, in June of the same year, the three had a shootout with law enforcement. Um, Cherokee Bill shot and killed a lawman, Sequoia Houston. Uh, Jim Cook was severely injured in the shootout. And so the other two, they took him to Fort Gibson. Meanwhile, Cherokee Bill took off. So after they dropped, you know, Jim off at Fort Gibson, Cherokee Bill, he took off to, uh, to his sister's to hide from the law. While he was laying low, his wife's, uh, his sister's husband began to beat her and so you know crawford again his mama named him crawford we're gonna try to stick to crawford anyway crawford shot him to death while he was beating his sister i don't know how many sisters he had because he shot his other brother-in-law for beating his sister So, how many sisters did he have? I didn't think about that when I was when I was researching, but I should have thought about that. How many sisters did he have? He had two sisters. He had three, four, five. How many siblings did he have? I didn't think about that until right now. Uh. Anyway, he shot his other brother-in-law to death again. This time, he could be persecuted. Um, afterward, Bill Cook and Cherokee Bill started their gang and began terrorizing Oklahoma. So after, you know, the time passed and they laid low for a couple of days, they were like, all right, we're going to get ourselves a gang together and we're going to start running these streets. Letting these streets know who is here and who is here, it is us. I really have no idea what I'm going to do with this eye makeup, but we're going to figure it out. Okay, we are going to figure it out. Um, yeah, they began to terrorize in Oklahoma, while, uh, first starting with robberies and then murdering anyone that got in their way. So y'all yeah, thought Rupert's Buck Gang, they was book wild, you know, in just four days. Like just like a four week 
not even four weeks, like a two week little tirade across Oklahoma. They took that and they said, level up. All right, level up. And so let's get into their crimes, all right? On July 16th, the same year which we are in 1894, Okay, on July 16th, the gang robbed a man named William Drew. Two days later, they held up a train. So July 18th, they held up a train. On July 31st, 1894, the gang stole $500 from the Lincoln County Bank in Chandler, Oklahoma, killing one person and wounding, and wounding, wound, wounding others. The cup game was highly pursued by law enforcement, of course. On August 2nd, 1894, a shootout occurred. Um, two lawmen were shot and injured. Uh, two gang members were killed and one was captured. Uh, the rest, they were able to flee. On September 21st, they robbed the P uh, JA Parkinson and Company store, getting away with over $600. Uh, several weeks later, on October 11th, the gang robbed a railroad twice in one day. Same railroad, they hit it up twice. <laughs> Same railroad, they hit it up twice. It was like, yeah, we're not done. We're not done. Um, that last train didn't have enough for us, so we're going to come back. We're going to come back and we're going to hit it up one more time, just to be sure. Um, what color should I do? Peach. Which I think. Peach. Maybe. Do something peach, peachy. Yeah. I'm gonna stick to one little palette, the sweet peach palette. We're gonna stick to that one. Okay. So October 11th, then I hit this railroad up twice. Nine days later, they arrived another train. I guess trains was was the place to hit up. Um. I guess so. I was. I would think maybe. Yeah. I would think if you think better, yeah, maybe the trains were the place to hit up. It was the main place of transportation. Okay. Rich folks, poor folks, everybody's possessions. If you travel on the train, your possessions was there. And uh yeah. I would say. I would say. Okay. On November eighth, the gang robbed general store. Okay. During the robbery, an innocent bystander named Ernest Melton was shot and killed by a Cherokee Bill. Okay. Shortly after the U.S. Marshal Cart uh, halt win of the gang, uh, but uh, Crawford, he escaped when they tried to capture him. Um, now, his final act as an outlaw happened on December 31st, 1894. Okay, when he acted alone in a robbery uh, of a train station in Natawa, Oklahoma. Uh, he was caught. He was captured on January 30th, 1895 um, and delivered to Fort Smith, Arkansas. Okay, um, that's where he awaited trial. On February 26th, uh, Cherokee Bill was tried for murder, for murder, murder. He was tried for murder and found guilty. Um, on April 13th, he was sentenced to death. Okay. Um, during his sentencing, he he seemed very unbothered by the news. Uh, simply because he was planning to escape. So he was like, child... I'm not even worried about this whole little death sentence because baby, I'm I'm planning to be out. All right. Um, 
So, uh, in 1895, he attempted a jailbreak. Um, you know, a shootout occurred and a standoff happened. And the guards were not able to disarm Crawford. So, uh, he was also, at the time, he was also jailed with another notorious outlaw named Henry Starr. And so, you know, Starr was like, I'm help, I'm help y'all out. I'm help y'all out. Um, I, well, disarm, I offered to disarm Crawford. If only y'all do not kill him as soon as he is disarmed. Okay. Y'all promise me that I will help you. And so, you know, Star got, got Crawford to surrender, which later helped, you know, Star gain his freedom later. But in the meantime, you know, Crawford's later, uh, lawyers, they were working on an appeal, which again was denied. Um, on March 17, 1896, Crawford Cherokee Bill Goldsby was hanged in front of spectators. Um, his mother, she took his remains back to Fort Gibson and buried him in the Cherokee National Cemetery. Uh, he was only 20 years old. So again, he was only a child. He was only a child when he started his life of crime. And he turned 18 and said, bitch, this is it. And guess what it led him to being dead two years later. Am I giving drag queen? I feel like I'm giving a slight drag queen, which is fine. Okay, we gonna do a little something with these brows here. Just a little something with the brows. I myself need to work on this one right here. This. Because it's a little raggedy right there at that end. Actually, I just need to touch my entire brow because this is dark and then this is dark. So, yeah, I just need to do my brows, honestly, truly. I feel like I should have did that before I got through this camera, but. You know what? It's fine. It is fine. We gonna go with the flow. All right. <sighs> and after we get done with the brows here. We are going to talk about our next person. Oh God, those are dark. Like two dark caterpillars on my face. this better <laughs> took a little I had like some excess powder on this sponge and so brought some of that away oh. that looks better okay now our next person is Jim Beckworth okay Jim Beckworth. What can we t say about Jim Beckworth? First things first. Jim Beckworth was named James Pearson Beckworth, born April 26, 1798, in Virginia, and died around 1867 in Denver, Colorado. 
He was a mountain man that lived in, with the Native Americans for an extended period of time. His father was white, his mother was a mulatto slave, and um, his father took him to Louisiana Territory in 1810, eventually to St. Louis, Louis, where he was essentially freed, okay? It said that his features resembled those of Native American people. Um, in 1823, Beckworth signed on as a groom with a fur training expedition. Uh, the following year, he was hired to handle horses on the expedition to the Rocky Mountains. Um, while he was in the West, he married several Native American women. He also had a black wife, but um, we don't know the names of any of his wives, Native American or Black. Um, and, you know, he essentially settled down for about six years to live among the Crow tribe. Uh, it's said that he impressed the Native American so much uh, with his strength and skill. Uh, but, you know, Beckworth, he was known to exaggerate his stories a little bit. Okay. He returned to white settlements in 1833, apparently abandoning his wives. He established a route through the Sierra Mountains for gold rushers in 1848. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. I am doing this and cannot talk at the same time. I mean, I can, but like, this is my other side, so I can't really see my notes here. All right, uh, for gold rushers in 1848. In 1856, he met a journalist named Thomas D. Bonner, who recorded many of Beckworth's uh, recollections and put them in a book. Now, only thing is me to hunt down that bachelor that I bought. Okay. He participated in the Mexican War and then soon after he returned to Missouri. Uh, he then put, he then joined settlers bound for Colorado. Um, he served as a guide and interpreter for U.S. troops in the Cheyenne War of 1864. Uh, then again, settled near Denver. Okay. His cause of death is unknown. Some say he died during a hunting trip or, or he was poisoned by one of his former wives. I'm having a hard ass time opening this. Um, it's also speculation that he was poisoned, you know, by the actual Crow tribe while he was guiding the military column. Um, he complained of severe headaches and a nosebleed before they got him back to his home um, where he died of natural causes. Um, the motive would have been that they didn't trust him after the Sand Creek Massacre. Great. Got that. Okay. Now, our next little person that we're going to talk about today is none other than the legend himself, Bill Pickett. That is also what does it look okay? Then. There's this one. Mm. 
And there's this one. I think I wore these last time. Well, okay. While we are over here trying to look at lashes, all right, we're going to talk about Bill Pickett. Okay, Bill Pickett. Bill Pickett was born December 5th. Oh. Okay. Bill Pickett was born December 5th, 1870, in Williamson County, Texas. Died April 2nd, 1932. Okay in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He was a rodeo cowboy who introduced bulldogging, which is a modern rodeo event. He is a descendant of Native American and black slaves in the Southwest. Um, he grew up in the West learning to ride and rope, um, eventually becoming a ranch hand. Okay, he will perform. He will perform simple tricks in his town on weekends. Uh, but by the 1900s, we, uh, he became a showman, sponsored by Lee Moore, a Texas radio entrepreneur. Um, entrepreneur. In 1907, he joined the 101 Ranch. Uh, Wild West show, becoming one of the star performers. Uh, he performed until about 1916 after he worked as a cow hand and a rancher. Uh, he later appeared in silent films, um, The Bulldogger and The Crimson Skull. Okay. Uh, he died after being kicked in the head by a horse in April uh, 1932. Um, he survived like several days in a coma before succumbing to his wounds. Um, in 1971, he became the first black honoree to be named in the National Cowboy Hall of Fame in 18. 89 he was also honored in the pro rodeo hall of fame okay i'll let that dry and last but not least um we are going to talk about gertrude smith aka treacherous trudy who in the movie is played by regina king and i'm going to tell you this i've scoured the internet Okay, scoured the internet because Gertrude Smith, aka Treasure Shooty, she was a real person. But as we said in Miss Mary Ellen's video, some people they didn't want their business out there. And as confusing as Miss Mary Ellen's timeline could be, you could you can pick and actually build a timeline for her you know from the information that we have but miss gertrude smith miss treacherous trudy that is not the case that is not the case because again scour the internet trying to find information on this lady and because I almost did not include her here is what we have to say about Miss 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 Gertrude here um Gertrude Smith aka Treasure Shooty is a real person she was a real person okay but most of her life wasn't documented um as in damn near any of her life. You can't even find her birthday, nothing, nothing. 
You just know she, you can find pictures of her, but her life, any life information, none of that. You cannot find that. You cannot find it. You can't, you can't find it. Um, we do know that she was pickpocket from the Wild West and will partner with a, uh, with a girl named Dolly Mickey. Okay. Together, they will perform their daily duties of pickpocketing, stealing. And that is all we have of Miss Gertrude Smith. Okay. And that was the lives of the real people um, behind the movie, The Harder They Fall. Uh, like I said, Miss, Miss, Miss Gertrude, she, girl, again... If y'all can find the information, send it to me. Uh, because again, I, I looked, I looked, I searched. I could not find it. But if you can somehow find it, please, please tell me. Send send me the links, honey. Send me the links. Um, but that was the lives of the real people behind The Harder They Fall. Um, thank you so much for watching. Uh, and going on this little journey with me. Uh, I will be back soon with another video. And until then, see you next time. Bye. It won't stop. <laughs> it won't stop.